I'm Richard Dodd, and you're listening to the Ecology Academy podcast. This is a show where we get to talk and learn about all things ecological, including interviews with top ecologists, both employers and employees, those working with ecologists, and also aspiring and inspiring career-seeking individuals setting out to make a difference. The show aims to provide you with insights, advice, and inspiration to help you succeed and excel as an effective ecologist and to make a real difference to our natural environment. Hi there, and welcome to this month's episode. Now, this month is a little bit different. I actually went outside for the first time for quite a while um, and recorded an episode with the fabulous, the wonderful, the passionate Emma Williams, a mycologist based in South Wales, but travels throughout the UK um, studying fungi. Now, Emma is extremely passionate about the, her subject, and this comes across in so many ways throughout this episode. Um, it was a pleasure to actually interview Emma out in, a, in her natural environment, out in a woodland just outside Caerphilly. And here we look at a few species and introduce them, but more importantly, have a conversation about why mycology is overlooked, how you can get involved, how you can become interested within fungi, how you start, the books you need, the sort of guides you need, and also a little bit of fun stuff. Well, I thought it was fun stuff. Talking about zombie fungi. We're talking about um, horror films, the apocalypse, lots of different uh, areas in which we're cropped up during our conversation. So stay tuned for out. There's a little bit of um, information about to say about how you can get into mycology. Also, there's bits that Emma talks about regarding, um, I say, conservation, how we survey sites and what we're missing and, and the implications of us actually not taking botanical interests in, into full consideration. When I say botanical, I mean the sort of, um, I say the fungi, the, the lichens and so forth. So enjoy this episode with Emma Williams. Um, you see sometimes what I call mass fruiting, shock fruiting, where a site will suddenly have thousands of broken bodies. It happened once on one of the spirals that um, I, I used to monitor, um, you know, uh, several times a week, um, the Mardi Colliery site. And it's this one year, the um, the Larch Belit, it started fruiting in March, which I'd never seen before. That was exceptionally early. It started fruiting in March. And it was like, whoa, that, that's odd. And coal spiral sites there, they're harsh environments anyway. Uh, they're toxic. They can be very arid, um, you know, and, and they got mosaic habitat. So each, each section will have a, a, a different, um, you know, uh, mosaic there. But you know your site and you think there's something odd going on here. So the larch bleach started fruiting in March um, in sort of, not huge numbers, but come July, massive numbers. And it kept fruiting and fruiting and fruiting. And then come December, it was still fruiting. It was mm. like, hang on a sec, we've had months. We've had months, which is amazing for the other um, animal life there because that, that site has um, swift swallows and house martins come in and bats as well. So for them, it was it was like, you know, meals on meals because the beliefs in particular, you see, they have uh, a strong association with diptera um, and the fungus gnat and one of the largest fungus gnats as well, which are huge and then really good pollinators, you know, when they mature. So these beliefs were, were breaking out um, with the uh, diptera constantly hatching out of them as well. Their, their, their little cases were popping up through the caps and you could see these huge numbers of, of diptera, but all year. And I asked the question at the BMS site, can fungi predict the weather? Um, and of course, a bit of a, a global uh, conversation. Um, nobody really knew. There was like uh, lots of anecdotal information on, you know, uh, a fungi can predict lightning and so on. So yeah, potentially. And it bothered me because yeah. this is one of my best sites and it bothered me that the larch bleed in particular was behaving in this way. Uh, it was still fruited in January. And it was like, whoa, it's now been fruiting almost a 12 months. This is absolutely nuts. So in January, we had still fruiting uh, Larch Belit and its rare associate Confidius maculatus, which is an amazing uh, species to see. That it, the, 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 It's not really known if it's parasitic with the Larch Belit or just a symbiotic relationship going on there, but it's a really rare species. And that was still fruiting in January. It was like, whoa. That year, we then had um, one of the record-breaking heat waves. Right. Um, so it was like, did they know? Yeah. Were they needing? Because they, they're they the ones protecting the trees. Larch Belit um, and Mycorrhizal were the trees on site. Um, and with Mycorrhizal fungi, they uh, they bring nutrient into trees, they bring water. 
they also take harsh metals away from trees. So if you've got, you know, coppers on site and so on, all these heavy metals which, you know, will bring a tree to its knees, they're actually able to um, prevent these, these heavy metals being absorbed by the trees. Um, and when a tree is under uh, duress or stress, they're able to produce um, antibiotics anti-inflammatories um, and even fungicides to uh, fungi that are going to cause them harm so all these magical things are going on with fungi and you think why on earth is this large belief doing this you know they need to produce spores to reproduce you know, they have to yeah. you know a fungus doesn't produce millions of spores just just for a joke you know their their niche habitat um, if they're microzyles or symbiotes they they need their hosts their associates to, to fruit with as well but the, uh, the spores also reinvigorate and regenerate um, and they can share genetic material. So if they're able to travel from one site to another, it may be the same species, but a different genetic strain. And it's like their ability where they're able to then invigorate and re-strengthen um, a species that's nearby. So all these spore relations are so, so important. Um, but it's always bugged me is, were the fungi predicting that heat wave? Mm. Because um, the coal spoil, uh, she does drought very rapidly. And, and for the best part of, of a year, um, she was like tinder. You know, everything was so dry. The mosses underfoot were, were crackling. But the trees were alive. The trees are doing fine. So that that that, that extra, probably the extra hyphae, the extra mycelium that they were growing, yeah. um, was connecting, 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 and finding those water sources and bringing that water into those trees that desperately needed it. So... Whether or not that question will be answered in my lifetime, can they predict the weather? I don't know. But the more you look, the more you see, the more you observe. You may not get answers, but you'll certainly get lots of questions and a, and a, a bigger wonderment and appreciation of fungi, yeah. which is why they're so, so fundamental in ecology. But we aren't discussing them in ecology. Um, yeah. You know, when you see a, you know, site reports, when you see site surveys, and you're desperately looking for the fungi survey, oh, what was there? And there's nothing, nothing there at all. No report. Mm. Ancient woodland, no yeah. report. Um, grassland, no reports. Tree planting that's going on, and they're not surveying for grass and fungi. And it's like, why? Mm. Why is it not being done? It's because it simply isn't on the agenda. Um, I did a little test of the day. Um, is I did a search on seam. Um, mycologist, grassland mycologist. It kept coming up. No. No, no one is available. No, no. but there yes. are members of SEAM that do funky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I know there's members. So why uh, why aren't those indicators even there within SEAM? Why aren't they there? So if somebody was like, oh, do you know what? I, I think maybe I should bring in an ecologist to look at this land before I do anything with it. Um, or I'm, I'm all change my management. I'll go to SEAM, the big, you know, the biggest um, body in, in, in the UK representing ecology work. And you put in mycologist, and it comes back no. no returns, yeah. <laughs> so there, therefore, you know, straight away, it it's, brings, it's not important. It's not important, mm. exactly, and it is so so important. You know, um, uh, the the fungi are. Um, I said they're fundamental. They're the understory of everything. They're you know you're, they're they're your decayers for starters. You know, if if you're looking. Um, that's a wonderful uh, dead hedge. I mean, that when the conversation up yesterday, a dead hedge. Um, I don't like the term dead hedge because for me, they're a wonderful yes. source of life. <laughs> I call them brash hedging yeah. rather than use the term dead because dead is negative. Yeah. Um, I used to be a funeral director, so dead is very negative. It's not coming back, you know, that's it. It's, it's over. Um, so um, for me, um, when you're looking at a brash pile, you're looking for those saprobic um, species that are breaking down um, that, that uh, smaller brash, the leaf material, the small twigs or the debris that's in there. Um, they can they then increase the moisture levels within there and the nutrient levels. So the understory you then get um, you know a lot of flora establishing mm-hmm. and, and coming through. Um, trees, uh, seedlings are protected within that brash line um, and are then doing tremendously because they also have the mycorrhizal fungi as well looking after them. Um, so a, a brash hedge is just full of absolutely teeming with life. Um, and it's like, yeah, yeah, please stop calling them dead hedge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to take a, take a message there, yeah. Yeah, you know, so for me, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, I, always, I always refer to them as a natural bug hotel. You know, uh, there's nothing, for me, there's nothing more sacrilege than um, burning on sites. Mm. And I've done it myself, you know, volunteering with land management, but for conservation, where um, a lot of material is burnt. Um, whereas a brash pile, 
for me, it, it's it's a no brain. It's common sense that um, if you're um, uh, looking after a site, that you are managing specifically for a species that very often can be adverse to others then you need to then um, do the best you can to establish other floral fauna fungi. Um, and so to burn material, um, I understand this, there's, there's huge amounts of it, then that becomes a problem. But brash piling, log piling, um, that should be um, common sense. There are community groups that I've seen recently that are still burning all material. Why? Um, you know, they're... If you see a log pile that's only been there for two years, you'll turn the log over. And I'm a log turner. You know, I love turning a log. Um, you'll you'll see um, bryophytes. You'll see liverworts. You'll see a plethora of, of insects. Um, you'll also see fungi, slime molds. Yeah. There's so much going on that could have been in a fire. So how do they how how do they occupy these? Niches then is it? As is is I say, is this the you know, is, is mycelium? Is it spores that, that um, eventually find them? Yeah, the I mean, it, it depends on the species. Um, again, not enough is always known. Um, but um, the beetles are associated with decaying trees, for instance. Um, it's one of the biggest questions of fungi is asked. We understand the shape on pollen, why pollen has a certain shape um, for its dispersal. Some are specialised in attaching to bird feathers, and we understand lots of things that go on there. But because fungi haven't really been studied um, properly, mm. it only really started in the 70s, you know, real, real study of, of fungi. Um, so what we now know is that um, the huge diversity of spores has to have a reason. And some of the more exciting experiments now, now being our studies on saprophytic fungi, uh, sorry, beetles that, that are specialists in decay, be it um, uh, beetles that cause pest, you know, um, you know the wood-boring weevils yeah. that, that cause commercial issue, or, you know, beetles that, that don't cause a commercial issue, they're just natural in their environment. Their electra, um, so they, they actually have a, a niche patination or shape of the electra that actually can hold certain spore shapes <laughs> so when they're boring into trees to lay their eggs when they're boring they're um either the specific species associated with them or other species well is attached to their electra or their legs or then the story when they're boring they're um transplanting these spores deep within the tree yeah. those uh spores are then germinating uh, starting to grow high feet and mycelium starting to break down if it's a, a fungus that breaks down the wood um, be it a white rot or, or a brown rot, they start to break down that wood into a pulp. By the time that uh, insect uh, egg hatches, that wood has very been softened, allowing the larvae to be able to feed. So very often, um, the, the pattern that they follow for a tree is following the hyphae, yeah. um, you know, that's already doing the job for them and softening that wood. So the, tr the two work together. Um, so again, is that when you're burning wood, you're actually destroying mm -hmm. an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only one other thing that's worse than the burning, and that is chipping. Um, you know, when you see um, land management um, and they use chipping, um, and they, it's like, why? It is complete destruction of habitat. When you leave, if, if you do a brash pile, so these little tiny thin bits, about two years, and, and they're breaking down. Thicker branches like this may be there for, for six, seven years. Trunks could be there for decades. Yeah. You know, it's, it's on average, it's 100 years plus, you know, for trees to actually break down. So when you're chipping, and of course with the situation now with Ash Dieback, is that we're losing millions of trees in the UK. A high proportion of those are being chipped. Yes. And that is terrifying because when you see the association with entomology and fungi, uh, and then the higher food chain that goes with ash, again, underappreciated. Um, there was a discussion a few weeks back um, regarding ash uh, for surveying work for ecology. And um, the ecologist was only looking at bats and birds. Yeah. And I asked the question, why are you not looking at the detrimental effect of the loss of the fungi? Oh, yeah, because bats are the, the, the important one in this picture. Well, hang on a sec. Do you know that lots of fungi species feed your bats, you know, by producing diptera, by producing flying insects, you know, they're associated. Yeah. And it was like complete and utter ignorance, never had a clue. Yeah. And he said, oh, at this point now it's too late because the budget has been done and we are only surveying the detriment to the bats and the birds, nothing else. I was like, wow, 
you know, it's never too late. That's where our <laughs> <for> started. <laughs> you know, it's never too late to go, oh, well, hang on a sec. We yeah. didn't even look at this. Um, you've got a, a group of beetles, um, the, the, uh, the netted wing beetles. And some of them are still red data listed. Now, you actually see them associated with white rock fungus in ash. Right. Why are mm. they not? Mm. I mean, because entomology has a, a, a as tough a ride as fungi, in all fairness. Again, they're not, they're not looked at. Um, again, it's crazy because if you were to lose your insects, you can't save the bats if you're just taking the food source away and it's not being done. Um, and it's compounding the, the effect, really, isn't it? Exactly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Cause because, like, you know, for, for when you're planning mitigation for a site and you're looking for wildlife corridors and you're mentioning that, you know, um, there's bats in an area here, therefore you have to have your corridor um, for a food source and so on. But there's nothing in that mitigation that says, well, hang on a sec, um, you know, uh, strongly recommend, insist that all dead materials on site yeah, are actually brash piled, uh -huh. you know, be, yeah. it, be it your dead hedge, brash hedge, whichever you want to do, or log piled, because you, you um, over a, a very short period of time, you produce a larder that um, while trees are maturing, because unfortunately um, nothing is going to stop the, this, this growing monster of, of cutting trees down, and that's never going to stop. But at least if as much material is saved on site, you're saving species that were reliant upon those tree species. Mm -hmm. You give them opportunity to complete their life cycle and to move on to um, neighbouring trees and also to produce a, a, an on-site food larder. You know, a, a, a living, breathing bag hotel. You know, when communities build these, you know, uh, brick hotels and, you know, that they've got the imported bamboo in there and, and all this stuff, I, I just think to myself, well... So, okay, so you've just now cleared your, your hedgerows around, you've tidied up the area, you've cleared your pathways, you've had a, a, a fire, and I've been on social media with your lovely photos of you having, um, you know, a little bit of a barbecue with your burning trees, yes, and, and you're burning, burning brash, yeah. and then you uh, then show when you your, your volunteers building bug hotels with um, artificial material, when you've just destroyed, mm -hmm. killed mm -hmm. countless species. In the stuff you're so we, saw, we need to we need to rethink, rethink the way we sort of manage sites or provide advice, really. Then. Yeah, yeah. You know, because as I say, you know, we we may deal with like landscape architects who create yeah. lovely nectar feeding rich uh, uh, gardens, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not you know, different plants and yeah. uh, for for you know butterflies, bees, yeah. and um, uh, um, bats and so forth. But yeah, yeah, we're forgetting actually a, a, a nectar rich food source. Yeah. In just a, it's a, a just a brash pile. And yeah. the thing is, I mean, it's um, nothing big has to change if you looked at it holistically. Yeah. And instead, it's, to me, it's, it should always be um, the knock-on effect. So, you know, you can't. Nothing is perfect. I mean, to do ecology work, you um, you have to have really thick skin and a soul that, that can bleed now and again mm. and get up the next mm. day and carry on. Mm. Because you you see devastation in habitat, you see complete loss, um, and in fungi survey work, I often have to have a mindset of it being lip service because I am recording what's going to be lost. Um, and like people say, why do you why do you put so much time in? Because I'll put time in, I'm not being paid for. Um, you know that uh, instead of an eight day on the scope work, I may spend eight nine days on the scope work achieving that species list. And the the way I see things is that, yep. It's going to be lost. That site is going to be completely lost. Mm -hmm. But it's a record. It's a record of what's been lost. So when, you know, ecology catches up with holistic ecology work yeah. and fungi in particular, then we know that this has already been lost. We already know how much devastation has already been. It's no good saying in 20 years' time, oh, oh crikey, you know, things, we've got ecological collapse here. Um, you know, what, what, what should have been in our habitat? Because they got, well, we never surveyed. We don't know. Where did the ecological collapse come from? You know, what, what, what's missing? You know, and, and nine times out of ten, I'll, I'll put money on it. The one thing that's missing is your fungi. Um, there's this uh, terrifying growing movement of um, agri-regeneration in woodlands where they're inoculating perfectly healthy woodlands to have a, an accumulation of fungi that would be in excess of a thousand species should it be surveyed. They think they're doing good by inoculating with other species of fungi. And most often so, these species are commercial strains, yeah. highly aggressive. You inoculate a tree year with commercial oyster. 
that commercial oyster has been um, chosen, genetically chosen, to grow on absolutely anything. Coffee grinds, wood chip, straw. A native oyster might have, uh, you know, a, a localised species might have a preference for hazel. And in that woodland, you may see on nothing but hazel. Or you might see as a preference for ash. And you see it grow on nothing else. I've seen recently in areas that are frequented by people um, that have, that there's indication that the inoculation has taken place. You see a little hole and a peg in a tree. And you see oyster growing on holly. Right. And, that terrifies mm, me. Mm. Because, you know, okay, I'm 44. And I've only been doing funky for the last 10 years. But I've also been observing my entire life. And I've spent my entire lifetime in woodlands um, and in hedgerows, you know, being a log turner. I've never, ever seen oyster growing on holly for the last five years. Right. You know, you could say, oh, is it climate change? But my gut instinct is, if we were to DNA check them, it's commercial oyster that's breaking out into wild areas, um, sometimes accidental with dumping of oyster kits. Yeah. Um, at the times that, yeah, intentional inoculation. It's a guerrilla movement that you see, on, again, social media, where they actually encourage um, people to um, uh, peg trees for free food. Um, why? Yeah. That tree will, also, will already have all the fungi it needs. Um, and if a new species is introduced, it should be a species that's natural in the area that maybe is associated with mm. a wood boring beetle or something else. That that's their food source, that's their tree of preference, and it, all in all, they have an ecological role, and they work together, one big happy circle. When you put in something that simply doesn't belong there, it then knocks everything out of place. Yeah. That commercial strain of, of oyster will literally take over, and you'll see it growing on, on wood chip, it'll be growing on, on any bit of dead tree, and multiple tree mm. species. And you'll change the structure, the whole structure of that potentially that woodland yeah. for generations to come. Yeah, and the thing is, is that because you have um, insects which sometimes are host specific to a certain fungal fruiting body, is that in the world of fungal war, um, you can see on this tree where I cut off a section, these black sections here, yeah. they are um, very often competing fungi. So you'll see very often um, coloured wool, col coloured uh, wood um, that has different shades of, of uh, blacks or browns but um, almost have uh, clear cutoffs because two species are actually met um, and they're fighting one another right. um, for dominance. The division line. Yeah, yeah the division lines. Um, so, um, and if anyone ever wants to look in, into fungal wars, uh, the work by Lynn Boddy from Cardiff ah, University mm -hmm. um, is amazing. Um, so it, so much goes on that we don't see. So when you introduce a, a species that's highly aggressive, highly commercial, they have the upper hand. Fungi in a natural environment recognise one another so um, if, for instance, now um, this hazel was uh, attacked by amaryllia, one of the honey fungi, is that if it's a, a, a native strain of, of amaryllia, the genetic code is, is almost always known by the microbiomes in this tree. That amaryllia comes along, yeah. they recognise it, they're ready of the warfare. They have the fungicide to actually keep knocking our amaryllia back. They can't, they don't always win the fight, but they keep knocking our amaryllia back with uh, fungicide. Suddenly, someone pegs a tree with a commercial strain that's completely alien. But very often, these are these American species as well. They'll peg a tree with a commercial alien strain of fungi, and the uh, and the fungi just go, "Whoa, what's going on?" They have nothing to actually no fight that, but no defence. Mm. Um, so even though that oyster isn't killing the tree, it's a probic. It's preventing and forcing out other species from fruiting. Yeah. So um, that knock-on effect can be absolutely huge. And no one is thinking about that bigger picture. Mm. No one is thinking, well, if I do this, you know, am I going to cause harm? And to me, the first rule in everything is always do no, no harm. harm. No. And it's the discussion isn't there. You oh. know, the conversation isn't there. Um, and uh, uh, this, this growing trend of agri um, work with fungi for regenerating a woodland, to me, it's it's insane. Mm. It's absolutely insane. Um, I had a discussion the other day with, uh, of all places, a community organisation in the New Forest, one of our most precious areas of the UK for ancient woodland, exception rare fungi, and they're introducing agri right. um, regeneration. And the comment that came back was so ignorant. Oh, but there's hardly or no 
fungi that fruits on the ground or in the trees in the area. Who surveyed it then? Yeah. Because it's impossible. If Mm. you've got trees, if you've got plants, there Mm. are fungi there. We don't always see the fungi, but your soil, the biome of your soil, it contains fungi. You know, your soil health is Mm. fungi. You know, so... For, for an organisation, they're educating others and they have events there and they're bringing people in to actually be taught and sending this message out for, across the UK is frightening. And it's like, how are, you know, uh, uh, England, uh, in, uh, for me, being uh, na- natural resources Wales, so in England it's natural England. Natural England. How are natural England allowing mm. this type of thing to take place? New forests. Yes. Agri yeah, generation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and it's like crazy. And yeah, they're gonna um, they're gonna use uh, commercial. Um, and she's in their experience, these species don't spread. Nice. What experience do you have? Because you know, um, uh, just a few weeks back, it was actually December. I think it was December, November. Um, Kevin McGinn at the Botanical Garden of Wales, a botanist there. He he uh, gave me a message. He said, "Em, he said that we'd already had the conversation about the dangers of oyster." And he'd had an oyster kit uh, early on in the year. And before he'd, he'd, he'd met me, he learned a bit more about fungi. He deposited his spent uh, commercial oyster gift in the garden. After it mm. fruited, put it in the garden. And he said, I feel terrible. He said, uh, that oyster kit that I put in the garden is growing on the wood chipper. It was like, oh, that's the sixth message we've had this week, mm. Kevin, mm. about mm. oyster kits growing in someone's gardens. Oh. Um, and uh, he said, it's, I've got oyster growing on my elder tree. And I was like, oh. I said, Kev, just, ask, uh, just answer me one question. Did you ever see fruiting jelly on there, the wood you, before? And is it fruiting now? He said, go and have a look. He came back. There all, has always been jelly fruit on. Jelly fruit's all year round as well, as yeah. long as conditions are correct. He said, there's not a single one on there, but there's lots of these oysters. What do I do? Mm, do you? Oh, no. So that is a tree that is strongly associated with wood you. Yeah. The had fruit in Woodyear, now had no sign at all, and only fruit in Oyster. So um, that is a tree, because he's in a position to be a botanist where he can study that tree a bit more, is that is a good, for me, that's potentially a good piece of evidence to show. Um, well, I hang on a sec, you know, um, you know, hopefully down the line, cut sections out that tree, show the fungal wars that's going on, yeah. um, and also DNA check to make sure that that ice that's growing is indeed commercial strain, and it's proven that we already see it, we see it happening. But it's been ignored. Yeah. Um, in, in America, they have an issue with the golden oyster that is spreading um, throughout its states that doesn't belong there. And it's causing ecological harm. You know, we already know how aggressive these things can be that mm-hmm. cause ecological harm. Um, but fortunately, people aren't, um, they're not, they aren't taking enough notice. Um, and they're being ignorant. Because there's nothing being spoken about in the ecological world. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, because uh, what well, little, well, little, little or no knowledge can be dangerous, uh, and also I suppose <laughs> also, uh, yeah, ignorance can be bliss, can't yeah. be really. Yeah, it? and the thing is, is that because um, uh, fungi uh, it catches people's attention now, yeah. it's fashionable now, and that's a danger. It's fashionable, and mm. um, at one time butterflies were fashionable, and what happened to the butterfly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know, we lost species. We we made species extinct because they were so fashionable that everyone wanted a butterfly. Yeah, um, and. If you study insects or anything at all, or, or you know, you know, if you're a bat person, it's like, well, where the hell does the food come from then? If they've just chipped out, oh yeah, we were planting two hundred new trees. What at what age will those trees be able to support entomology? You know, hazel, fifteen years or so before it starts looking interesting. So what what's going to feed all those birds and the bats? And in the meantime, when you Chipped everything and burned everything. Yeah, yeah. Whereas those bug hotels would be, would be feeding stuff for for years to come. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> so I can get on my high horse. There you go. Here. That's right. Yeah. I get on my, you know, everything has an ecological role. So you have uh, your your um, entomophoras, which are insect control, um, which I find fascinating, and like you know your zombie fungi, um, and other people go, oh, that's horrible, that's cruel. Well, there's no cruelty in nature. You know, nature mm-hmm. just, you know, it's it's a natural um, pest control. Like when you see, um, I always say people, if you're looking for cement in a bar, um, uh, Muscat is one of them, on, on the on the blue bottle family, is if you see a dead animal and there's a canopy above there or, or anything at all, have a look. So when you think, you know, if you don't like 
bad smell pitch your nose and have a look and i'll put money on it is that you'll have um uh, flies stuck to leaves mm-hmm. by the bellies mm-hmm. and they're covered in the entomophora uh, fungi that's actually because it's it's um it's spreading as well then around that corpse you know flies do spread disease yeah. So in, a, in, in one way or another as well, they, they could have a part as well in preventing mass spread of a contaminant. So if there was a, a, a disease animal died of that could be spread on flies, it's also reducing that, you know. But also grasshoppers, which of course, you know, can have a commercial issue. One of the most, you know, fascinating one you'll ever find is the Entomophora grilli, the Vex grasshoppers. And it, it actually reduces them, apart from the fruiting body that actually comes out of, out, out of the animal as well. The, it, it dries them. They wrap their legs around grasses. Um, and you'll always see, it's, it's a typical stance of any insect that's infected with fungi. It wraps their legs in, in such a way that it's cupping something. Um, and then the abdomen is, is where very often then attaches, the hyphae mm-hmm. attaches the abdomen first. So change the behaviour causes an insect to climb to the highest optimum point for, for spore uh, dispersal. But uh, the um, grasshoppers in particular, they always fascinate me because they completely desiccate and they almost look like a skeleton a grasshopper and they just you know like these big you know hollow eyes and and it's fascinating and uh, people say oh that's grotesque no it's nature mm. you know the yeah. fact that that fungus is con- they used to think it was mind control then understand now it's more muscle control you know, obviously with chemicals that, that um force the brain to change direction but they'll actually to that the ability to um cause a, a, an insect to change its behavior completely um, I find it fascinating, and, and in some aspects, the, the only world that's been uh, is investigated um, in any crop pest um, with entomophora, because they're looking for reproducing entomophoras in labs as well to actually use as a biocontrol right. method. Right. Um, but in nature, there's um, there's ones that infect ants um, in rainforests, and some of those ants are highly, highly destructive, like the marching ants, which can cause ecological um, uh, chaos, even um, collapse, because they will eat anything in its, in its path. The fungus controls their populations. So by actually, it always keeps that, that uh, species within a number. That yeah, it still has wreaks of havoc, havoc in some areas, but at the same time, it's, it's that if that fungus didn't exist, there is no natural predator of one of the, I think it's one of the fire ant species, uh, but they will eat, um, you know, flesh. So they will just keep on marching through and their colonies build and build and build but instead this fungus goes hang on hang on hang on a sec hang on hang on your numbers are just ridiculous now come back here come back here you lot are going to crawl up this tree and you're going to die so we I, I'd imagine that is this from reading, reading like scientific papers or is it yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's uh you know some people have better time reading of a nice book I did try reading a book you recommended and I do and I'm there then going oh that's yeah and I, I do take notes and uh, you know the time the time one yeah I do take notes and then um uh, and then I go I get a little alert then a pile of papers and I'm going oh and I'm downloading a paper and going oh okay yeah it's a uh, bedtime reading yeah. um it's it's something that you once you're into it you'll mm-hmm. never stop. Mm-hmm. Because there is something new being out every day, um, and because of me, I think because I, I like to I like to know what's going on as well, and uh, you know things will never you know I may never get to see those those uh, Amazon ants, but to me it's a mind blowing, yeah. um, and uh, I love horror. I love horror films. It's not very often a horror film uh, makes me. I can, in fact, I can't think of any horror film that ever makes me think that could happen in real life. Like people say, well, I grew up in a cemetery, Richard. <laughs> yes. So I grew up in a cemetery watching horror films with zombies and walking the walking dead <laughs> you know when i watched the walk and it was him like, are you, how can you do that because they're not real mm. you know mm. the, the dead body's never gonna animate itself it's never gonna happen you know because biologically that can't you know you just fall apart you know all these things you know it's not gonna happen and it's common sense really common sense but um pathogenic um fungi are something different and as yet they haven't crossed that that boundary we've got the 350 species of fungi on us and in us you know we've only known that for the past couple of decades that's how far behind fungi yeah. is in in human discovery um so they're already growing in us and on us you know one of the biggest causes of premature baby death is due to fungi mm. you know and that's you think why did they take so many years to discover you know, that it was fungi that was killing these little, um, premature babies, you know, in the immature gut. So um, it's 
So you wonder what else Funky could do. Yeah. And then there was a horror, and if you ever, if you don't mind horrors, there's a horror that came out a couple of years back, The Girl with All the Gifts. Right. Now that is a horror that uses Fungi. Mm-hmm. And when you watch that, uh, <laughs> although there are some little, little, little uh, tidbits in there, like, but my, my claws were head because I go, oh, you didn't quite get that no, right. Yes. <laughs> you didn't quite get that right. But the baseline of the story, it made my mind go, Ooh. Right. It's a, a zombie version. Yeah using um fungi okay. so so you know it's, it's basically infecting humans change their behavior makes them highly aggressive mm-hmm. violent mm-hmm. It, it's so any other human they they, they they go into attack which then allows them then also to make that contact to spread those spores mm-hmm. and there's a, at the end of the film there's a one big giant um you know sporulating mass um <laughs> but there was a few that was a few bits they had wrong that, that was a right. bit like that that no that isn't quite right that isn't quite right <laughs> But at the same time, then it made my mind go. When yeah. Fungi make that jump, because again, these subjects that these things are not being discussed in the wider world is that Fungi, um, so certain species of Fungi can't can't survive in in the in the human because of temperature, and our core human body temperature protects us. The human core is changing, mm-hmm. and it has mm-hmm. been for decades, which wasn't being recorded. And it's only in more recent studies where they, they know that, um, you know, in different countries that people have a different core temperature. So the medical core, which bases on are you healthy, are you feeling well, isn't the same globally. It's not the same. But we are changing globally anyway. And when that core temperature becomes optimum for pathogenic fungi, that's when I think we might yeah. be in trouble. Yeah. So, I always, you know, to me, when people say, oh, yeah, we're going to end the world, you know, uh, or we're going to press that button. Mm. If, if if no one presses that button, fungi will do it eventually. Yeah, I don't. really, yeah, I think they, I think, you know, it's not viruses we have to worry about. It's not bacteria we have to worry about. It's fungi making that jump um, to be able to actually, they're, they, I mean, they're already infecting all insects. Yeah. You know, insects have a brain, you know, they, they, they you know, they, they have a vascular system. They have muscles. You know, yeah, it's not a, it's a huge leap, is yeah, it? Really, yeah, to uh, yeah. yeah, you know, and they already <laughs> fungi already cause massive problems for humans and for or for mammals. Mm. But it's that jump to um, that the mind control. I mean, there's fungi. You get fungi in your brain. Mm. You know, mm. um, they can affect your brain. You know, so you know there's fungi in the soil, which can cause you, you huge problems. Aspergillus, you know, is huge problem um, if it gets into into the body of, 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 a, of a frail person. You know, perfectly healthy person wouldn't bother them. I, I, you know, I handle aspergillus on uh, wax caps. Very often you see blackening on a wax cap. Um, that, that's a strain of aspergillus. If it gets into an open cut, that could mm. cause problems. Mm. So I'm always mindful. You know, when I'm collecting specimens, um, if it's the only wax cap there that I can that I can take that and it has it on there, okay, I'm more careful. Uh, and it's in a pot, and it's you know I handle it with care. And I'd always I'd always scope the aspergillus just because they me aspergillus. You need to culture get species based aspergillus. Um, but it's that jump um, that yeah, in the back yes. of my mind it's almost like a little chuckle but I think nah mm. nah you know it's Corby got nothing on fungi mm. you know it's something that uh, I think uh, if you're it's not one to look into if, if you're a warrior not don't uh, yes uh, <laughs> yeah no, no, we'll, we'll keep the anxiety to a minimum yeah, or, or, or to, 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 to a bearable minimum. amount yeah. but uh, when I yeah. saw you know it was one of those uh, it was the first time uh, a horror film actually stopped me in my trap yeah, it was like yeah. Oh, so you, you, you probably took a lot more interest in that film than yeah, any Yeah, because it mentioned it was, I was like, mm, oh, i got to watch yeah, this yeah, bit. Yeah. You expect it to be, you know, because um, they make always make so many mistakes on the horror. You know, like uh, for me, like the zombie films alone, it's just the animation of, of, of a body that's, uh, you know, I said I, I used to be a funeral director, so I know the various stages that the human body goes through. You think that uh, it wouldn't be possible. It's not going to happen, you know. We're after a fortnight, an arm can fall off. There's no way Joe Bloggs is running down the street, you know, six weeks after he died, and I'm, you know, and, he, and he's still decaying. It's not going to happen. But so this was the first time it was a horror that did make me go, oh, it's one of those moments you wish you didn't know anything mm. about mycology. Mm. <laughs> you think, oh, because I'd always wondered, you know, could it ever happen? When would it happen? But then when horror. You know, the realm of horror actually picks up on it. It's like, I'm glad people talk about mushrooms, though. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the bonus, you know, the bonuses here. People are actually, it's making, it's making a big screen. Black nose. Just there. Okay. You're not familiar oh, with an eyepiece. It's um, just alter the distance until it matches your eye. Yeah. 
Look so these little, little bits of like, like salt granules, aren't they? Yep, so they look the, the, the yeah, they have a And if you look, there's a little sort of hairy margin on there as well. Um, and again, they're also probics, they're breaking down. Um, they're also food source. Um, so everything, you know, fungi, they feed, they break down things, they, they, they feed things, and they're just uh, vital for ecology. And that's something that, okay, you know, for, from an ecological perspective on a survey, um, maybe it's all species that um, you would want to take your time in um, identifying. So you've got some uh, amar- amaryllia here, so that's honey fungus strands here. Oh, right, yes, yes. So these are what they could refer to as being boot places. Yeah. Um, so that's an indicator that um, this area has amaryllia. Uh, without seeing a fruiting body, you wouldn't know the species because you can't tell the species from just the um, the, the the cords there. You need an actual fruiting body. Yeah. Um, and again, we've got uh, lots of tiny little ascomycete. Yeah, you can see just, like a, you say that lace, that sort of a thread. You've got fungi here. Um on a catkin. Now that could be conidial of um, another species or a mould. Um, but again, when you come down to conidial stuff, very often it's DNA work um, to actually get to uh, a species. And we're talking millimetres here, aren't we? Oh God, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, fractions of millimetres in a lot of the stuff I look at. Mm. Um, and uh, I've got, I use like the proverbial sewer rat when I see stuff. Um, you know, s- s- some, well, Mike Wright, uh, he nicked me uh, nickname me first going off is um, eagle eyes um, because if I was out on a the site there'd be there wouldn't be much I'd miss everyone missing yeah. something you can't yeah. see everything yeah. um, but if, if there's a good to be fine I, I'll pretty much uh, I'll I'll sniff it out um, <laughs> and again it's it's um, it's not just luck because the fungi certainly is luck and tiny on what to come any one day just much larger but there look oh my yes oh yeah that's a good couple of centimetres, those are. Yeah, yeah, much, much larger. And there's no sign of that bulky on the water edges. And another fungus. That's like a creamy colour. Creamy yellow. And this is one of the Hymenocyphus fungi. And I need a microscope to determine. Oh, yeah. And these, these ones you'll see, um, in, they, they specialise in wetter areas. Yeah. And again, they're breaking down um the the wood so it's a probic species constantly breaking down so i mean in there like this you get a you know a combination of uh anaerobic um behavioral bacteria and so on breaking down and decay but also um onto your fungi if it were not for the fungi then yeah, all yeah, this dead yeah. tree material would just keep piling up piling up piling up and it wouldn't be going anywhere so how long it, would it take to get to this? I mean, we've seen some earlier on, which would look like, like a, yeah, half a centimetre to one centimetre, and it, it leaves about five. So, I mean, is it, is it just over time that's um, it, or is it, or is it condition sort of with, um With fungi, they can take anything from hours to reach full size maturity um, to days or even weeks mm. or even years, right. in, in the case of some of the risputinates and the ganodermas. Um, but it's how long to piece of string. Because right. it comes down to uh, down to condition. Um, what we saw over there um, was um, almost certainly fully mature. Yet it was a, a quarter the size of this year. Yeah. Um, so size doesn't determine maturity um, because there's too many ma- too many variabilities, and especially with the elf cups, they can be you know you can find some which are, which are virtually as big as your hand. Um, why? Don't know. Mm. You know mm. why? Why have they grown to that size? And the honest answer is don't know um i it's it's you understand why sometimes they ha- can be taller so this year it's got quite a, a significant stem yeah or pseudo stem as we'd call them on one of these they're not um so it's got quite a distinct stem on this one yeah now the one that we saw earlier on had no stem because it didn't need to whereas uh, because it was a, a piece of wood sitting on the water surface and it had no need to have a stem at all because it had the optimum airflow, uh, there was nothing surrounding it, whereas this one was growing up through the plant and, and the fern material here and the leaf fall, so it needed the height uh-huh. to optimise the potential um, for the for the, um, the spores. So this is one of the Ascomycete family. So this one, um, the spores are actually, this is the fertile surface in here, in here which has been chewed away. Mm-hmm. 
um, uh, and then when it's disturbed or there's a change of airflow or change of temperature, it will um, instinctively, the mechanism goes off and the ASCII inside will actually shoot out the spores at a tremendous speed yeah. um, then to release then uh, for the spores to travel on wherever hit them or whatever airflow was actually um, disturbing them. Um, and that's their, their method of spore dispersal. And sometimes if, you, if you're lucky and you, and you approach these outcomes, they're, they're a great one to actually see the spores being released. Um, and you'd actually see little plumes yeah. if we're not lucky enough here. You can either blow on them, give them a little tap. Like when I'm getting a spore um, specimen back at home, um, I sit them in petri dishes, and every so often I'll just give them a little flick or tap the top um, to actually get the spores to be released. So how would you train as a mycologist then? So um, is, um, there, is, there, is there actually a course or is it... A- <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, with um, Q and I will have uh, a course um, based in strictly only in London. Um, for uh, academically with fungi, uh, the, the only route in really is uh, PhD work, um, where obviously that's not the easiest thing to do either. Um, but for anyone that's interested in taking up um, mycology, it's firstly being enthusiastic. Yeah. That's the one thing you need above everything is enthusiasm because it's hard. And when I say hard, you, you know, some days you'll sit there and you'll want to cry <laughs> because you've just spent four hours, you know, you've done everything right. You've used the books, you've, you've done the key in, you know, you've used the chemicals, you're at the microscope and you've got all the features that you need. And then you're sat there with your book that's costing you arm and a leg. Um, and it then comes down to cannot be distinguished without sequencing. Right. And it's like, whoa, mm. I've got this far. I've spent this long. I always tease people with court is that, you know, you will be reduced to sitting in a dark room with tissues and biscuits crying. Um, and anyone that takes up microscope work, I can't recommend biscuits enough. I really can't. I mean, this is how we get to the size, you know. Um, it's biscuits because they uh, soothe the soul right. um, and comfort. Um, you know, when you've done all that you can and you're still faced with that. But there are other routes because if you are quite accomplished in what you do and you're confident and your score works good and your knowledge is good then you'll know when you have something that's different or exciting um and you can then um send uh, specimens to Q, or you've got the the, the uh, darwin tree of life pro- program which is uh, for fungi the the f told uh, fungi tree of life um and some stuff have, uh, can be cultured as well um or at least DNA sequenced um, to find out exactly what you have, yeah. which sometimes is the only route. And sometimes it's the only route because it's a species that's not yet known um, to the UK or to science. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, a top mycologist to know when you've found something different. Um, I've been lucky. I mean, I've had new to, to UK species, um, you know, in fungi. I've had new to UK species in, in, in vertebrates as well. Because um, you you just know, uh, you know it, it takes time. It t- not everyone has. I used to have a photographic memory, um, and uh, so it, when I come across a big in the field, um, the keys flash through, so I'd know, you know, never seen this before, not recognised any keys, never seen an image of it, yeah. and then I know, and I do the same with insects as well, um, but. Um, it sometimes just comes down to, to, to get. Um, and like I say to people, there's nothing lost um, by taking, if there's plenty there, never take a single specimen, yeah. ever take a single specimen. Mm-hmm. It's if it looks exciting or it, you know it's rare um, and it's not licensed, like, you know, you can't do this with lion's mane, um, take a section out. Um, take enough mate- genetic material, or organic material, I should say, to actually be able to do the spore work and to be able to have something that can be dried and sequenced if need be. But you don't have to be this. I mean, citizen science. I started out with fungi as no more than citizen science. You know that that enthusiasm, the need to know, the the growing um, curiosity of well, you know, well, well, what should be in this habitat, and what what should be in that habitat, and then everything coming together. Um, you know, but it takes. I mean, uh, thousands of hours I've spent yeah. on fungi. You know, um, in the field, looking on the microscope. Um, so when I've looked at um, uh, the ash dieback um, is at last my seat that grows on the keys, which is um, the the fruiting anamorph of the disease. So 
there's also another one, Fraxinus uh, alb- albinus, which is uh, looks exactly the same in his microscope work. Um, and I didn't just look at one or two. I literally spent days, I think it's about two and a half weeks, sorry, and I just collected these keys um, from every site I was going to. I was, I, I was having keys sent in the post because I wanted to know for myself, can I split in the, in the field? Because yeah. there is one key difference that I found was not consistent. The, 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 the base of sclerotina at the base um, blackens um, on um, uh, the ash dieback. I found that wasn't consistent. Because when you put them under the scope, mic- microscopically, the only thing that splits them is there's croziers, which are like little brackets um, on the um, ash dieback. They're not present on albedus, it's lookalike. So when I was actually looking at those, um, I think, well, okay, that's got the black spirit here, so it must be. Do the scope work, no croziers. It wasn't. It wasn't. So for me, it wasn't mm-hmm. consistent. Mm-hmm. It was something that um, is, is in keys. But no, for me, it was a case of but that took um, hundreds and hundreds. Because um, I also then, the other curiosity then kicked in, was could you get the two species on one petiole? And from what I found in my limited, although hundreds, um, in my limited um, time looking at them, is that um, you'd only have the one species. So again, um, it's whether or not um, they were uh, more gr- the the thing is, Ash back it is highly aggressive, so it likely it was. It was actually pushing out the other species. Um, so an ecological, uh, you know, has an ecological effect on other associated fungus as yeah. well. Um, I never, ever found, um, uh, and some, sometimes you had keys with 30 of these cups on there. So it was um, it was like losing the will to live <laughs> after two weeks. And I, I gave up in the end, just gave up because I'd spent so many days and hours, you know, from, from first in the morning to six o'clock at night, just, you know, key after, key, you know, each one after each one, after 30 fruiting bodies on a petiole, and then going, nap, it's all tracks and that, it's all, um, it's all, uh, and then just going, nap, couldn't, couldn't find the two species merging on one. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that was a concern, you know, because the, up until uh, we had Ash Day back, um, we only had the one species on the, on the petiole. Now, it was difficult finding the other species. Um, and then, because I like my insects, as I started as a log turner, is that my mind then switches to, um, you know, was there an insect associated that we don't yet know? Because we're not looking at fungi, we're not yeah. studying fungi yeah. enough to know, did that, um, you know, did that little cat fungus feed something? Did it have a specific host? You know, did it have a role in ecology? And um, besides breaking the petiole down, did it have another role that is now being missed, um, that's been forced out? Um, so again, so with fungi, you always get more questions. Yeah. They never ever end in. So if you, I was starting out, if you know, advice to me then, so if I was starting out looking, trying to get into my, you know, you know, learning a lot more about fungi, um, which, what, where would I start? If you're starting out, yeah. um, this is the, the book that I recommend to anyone learning. Um, and I recommend it for a very specific reason. Is the Collins Complete Guide to British Mushrooms and Toad Stalls, which is the photographic guide. Yeah. Again, this doesn't include um, every species in the UK; it's just a fraction of them. But the reason I like this book, um, and it's one I, I use when I'm sort of uh, helping the, the public engagement work and, and helping other mycologists as well, is it's got lots of basic um, information mm. uh, to get the mind working. Fungi and ecology, you know, the classifications, um, just the. Uh, the actual habitats that they come into, the genera and the groups. So it's all the basic information that actually gets you thinking in plain English. Yeah. This isn't mm-hmm. overcomplicating things. Um, it's very straightforward. It has some really good, clear pictures in here. Um, and it gives what I like about this one. It, it uh, gives um, a habitat, which lots of books don't. Yeah. Um, it also tells you its status, okay. which is important mm-hmm. as well. But the information may not be entirely accurate because uh, in the UK our fungal record is very fragmented um, you've got the uh, FRDBI with the BMS you've got CAT2 with fungus conservation you then have of course all your different you know MBA atlas um, and your different networks of recording uh, networks so it's very fragmented so the information may not be entirely accurate um, because records are also you know biased yeah. you know yeah. and, and yeah. we're not studying and, and identifying fungi well enough um but this this is the book that I would act- actually recommend to anyone learning. 
and, and in the back, um, it's got, uh, which is always good. I mean, it, it covers everything. Um, but you've also got uh, rare and unusual fungi. So if someone wants to um, hunt out, um, like the orchid hunters of the fungi world, <laughs> if they want to go and find the really good stuff, yeah. it should contain some of the more exciting stuff in here as well. Um, so you can actually, you know, actively seek out if you want to do just the good stuff. Um, you know, to have those big ticks in your mm-hmm. uh, in your listing. Um, but also, it has these sections on the, the typical species you'll find in certain in certain habitats, which is um, really, really good as well. So when you're in, if you know you're in a beech woodland, yeah. then you're looking uh, to see if these indicator species are there. Um, if you're on coal spot, you'll find all these bloody species everywhere. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a nightmare. Spanner in the works, coal spot. I wouldn't recommend anyone that's learning um, unless you're... Um, very resilient to go to to coal spy because you will be um swamped overwhelmed and might give up after the first week so start out in specific habitats small areas a hedgerow anywhere that you can actually look and learn um you know and this book it will serve you so so well um in you know the information you need is there um so it's a really really good book it's a really good um basic images then once you're confident and you're using this book very well. You're understanding what to look for. So it tells you the, the gill feature, the stipe, the cap, the habitat. Um, you're looking for those features. Once you've got that um, nailed and you're in the field and you're instinctively, you're looking for, um, you're remembering what was the cap like? Mm-hmm. What were the gills like? Mm-hmm. Take, always take good quality photographs of all those features. Some features are below ground as well. So unfortunately with ID work, you have to lift. Um, which like people say, oh, but you know, you always tell people, um, you know, it's don't go picking fungi. Um, well, yeah, but for ID work, it's it's essential. If we don't know it's there, we can't conserve. So when you're identifying um, a habitat for fungi, it's essential. You know, lift, you don't have to take your home. Yeah. You can even sit you after. And it's still carrying out its ecological role. It's still spore dropping. Any insects already in there, the larvae, are still completing the life cycle. Um, you know, it's it, you're not doing any, any knock on harm. And it's essential. We need those records. Um, and I would encourage anyone to have a go. Yeah. Um, and there are so many mycologists out there, myself included, that will give you as much help and support as you're needing. Uh, and I'm renowned for waving the stick um, and occasionally poking the stick. Yeah. Um, and if need be, I'll whack you with that <laughs> stick. Because if I see somebody yes. that has uh, potential and they can be guided and pushed a little bit harder, then I will. Because we need more people out mm. there. We need mm. ecologists that have um, a natural instinct. I mean, I travelled to um, Shropshire uh, back in November um, to uh, give um, Phil uh, a lesson um, in ecology. So, so, I mean, it was a three and a half hour drive for me, you know, each way. Um, but I drove up there, spent the entire day with him to look at so many different groups of fungi to get him his, his field um, uh id skills up yeah. remembering you know all the features remembering you have to smell everything smell is so so important on fungi you've got smells that can be anything from lemon um to to bleach to jay's fluid all the way up to you know um tars and sulfurs and ammonias so these aromas are there and if you were to ask somebody what does a mushroom smell like they'll think oh i don't know earthy mushroomy yeah and then if you can present them with a fungus, it actually smells of chocolate yeah. or lemon. And it's like, it's, it's a mind-blown experience. And it's something that, um, you know, lots of lots of mycologists forget to smell. You know, even, you know, seasoned mycologists is that they forget to smell. And um, sometimes those features are not even written in a book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes spore colour isn't in a book because it's not been documented. Uh, so um, you may be the first person that uh especially last my city you may be the first person that's actually noted what the small color is like um in a print because mm. it's not in the books gosh i mean there's 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 so much to it but as you say that's 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 i mean i've just looked for that book there and i mean and, it's and very the, visual it's, yeah. it's quite i mean that's fairly easy to what well, i'm looking at it's fairly easy to look at you yeah. know, you know visualize when and it's in your rucksack yeah and this book it's a very well very well fingered book that uh, yeah. oh do you know well this book um I, I i normally go through um one of these about um right. oh, do they are last years i mean oh, yeah. uh they're really high quality i've always gone in the rucksack yeah. this one um i had a bit of a hammering when i almost uh, almost lobbed my thumb off last november um uh, in, in the field 
Um, so yes, <laughs> that was in when I was getting my first aid kit out. Uh, that was on the bottom of the bag, but right. um, yeah. yeah, I mean this this scare's uh, dropped. Yeah. Um, it's uh, you'll you'll see this very often flying around. I've normally got two: one in the rucksack, one in the car, uh, and then several out on lawn. Um, and then they're flying around the dashboard or in the boot, and they take a hammering. Mm. I mean, you know, mm. they get they, it's a laminated uh, cover, yeah. so it can also take when you're out. In, you know, um, you know, can take getting damp as well. This has been uh, you know got wet a few times. Uh, hence why you can see the, the markings on the edge. Nice. Yeah. It's a really hardy book. And considering why where I spend on, on some of the funky books, this these ones yeah. are the best sort of anything from around fifteen pounds you'll ever spend when you're learning. Yeah. And then once you're um, once you move on from this book, that's when you start um needing things like yeah, I always call them the Kibbe keys. The so Jeffrey Kibbe, um renowned uh, UK mycologist is that if you're wanting to really identify fungi, you need his work. It's, and there's no there's no escaping it. You have to buy his work. But he is somebody that wants people to learn. So his books are affordable. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted a key on rustler, um, which is, uh, and that contains every known UK species of rustler, with a full key for your sport work, your, um, your sport coloration, the taste, everything is all in there, that's a £20 book. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's, it's larger, say, four size. It's not so that you're keeping a rucksack. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, you need it, you need it back at home anyway, really, unless you're doing the chem test in the field, um, with Gaelic and so on. Um, but they're, again, they're not too expensive. I mean, if you move on, um, and you start looking at niche things like, um, the, the monograph of a billiards, um, I was lucky. I got a pre-purchase order on that one from the French Museum when, uh, uh, they were going to release it. And it cost me 150. It's now 250. Wow. So it's, uh, it, it's, that's, that is the, the Bible yeah. of a billion. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'll, you'll, it'll never be another book like it. Um, and, but some of the stuff in there was, there was stuff I didn't know. It was mind blowing. Um, like a billion. Um, I'd already observed in the field that very often they had, uh, uh you'd see insects that were in a log that was full of billia, uh, hyphae on them. And, Without DNA work, what is it? I don't know. You know, is it is it uh, a hyphae from a fungal mould? Is it a hyphae from another fungi? Are they just consuming the organic material there? That book has done that work, and they've actually discovered that the um, some of the abelias are actually, um, in effect, uh, are pathogens to some insects. They actually take insects out with intention, and that's their food source. Wow, right. Uh, and, and to me, that was like, well, that answered that yes. question, yes, because the questions in, in my college aren't always answered. They'll be, you know, uh, they'll just bag you forever in a day. Um, but fun- again, fungi are amazing. One of, I mean, I'm I, I, um, very passionate about farming um, and, uh, you know, th- this, this ongoing problem of farmer bashing is that there are a lot of farmers out there doing good and a lot of farmers are trying to improve the way they do things. And... One of the, the issues, obviously, that we have, which is massive uh, a knock-on effect for um, invertebrates uh, and then their, their higher food chain, bats and birds, is the use of insecticides and pesticides. Um, so when you're, uh, be it um, any sort of grazing stock, be it your cattle or your sheep, um, you've got problems, obviously, with, with worms. Lots of the chemicals being used these days now, they become resistant to, mm. causing knock-on effect. Um, but those, those uh, insecticides are killing... Um, the invertebrates that feed on the dung, that then feed the birds. Yeah. So it's this massive ecological collapse um, in, in in farming when they use heavily. And when you say to a farmer, Mister Jones, see that lovely pile of shagging cat up there? And he goes, "Aye, lovely for breakfast they are." It's like, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I don't eat any fungi, but did you know that the shagging cat is also eating your nematodes, your parasitic worms in your pasture? And it's like the jaw drops. Yeah. Not pulling my leg now. No. No shagging caps are actually the their hyphae. Exactly oyster mushrooms do it as well. They lasso nematodes in the ground and they consume them. Right. Shaggy ink cap, which people only ever assume uh, as being um the uh when you ask them, Oh yeah, you can eat them. That's the first thing to say, yeah, shagging cap, you know, or lawyer's way you can eat them. Um no. They actually are amazing at pest control in pasture. And they spread like they can spread like wildfire if they're FB. Um, you know, also human compost heap. Um, you know, but they will um, grow very well in a pasture, and they're amazing yeah. at natural, natural pest control. Mm-hmm. And again, this isn't taught. No. 
you know, that the, this isn't shared within the farming community. They aren't taught, you know, is they you get trespassing or fought trespassing fraud you know, in, far, in the farming community and they go well, what defense have i got what can i say apart from trespassing you know well maybe you want to guard them a bit better because they are helping you reduce your your worm stock in the ground yeah. you know so it's said uh, they have a really important ecological role for your livestock you instead you can educate people and say please don't touch uh, those fungi because they're actually helping me cut down the use of insecticide with my flock. Yeah. Please stop. Um, hopefully, the odd person yes, will will change sense. their behaviour and will actually stop doing it. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's, it's uh, the, the world of fungi is just amazing, um, and there's so much that we don't know that we don't understand. But again, when you start looking at things holistically, so when you're doing land management, you automatically include that. You know, so it's not just about the conservation wax caps um, that uh, um, that I spend time on, obviously, in, in agriculture mainly, um, where they have, um, uh, you know, the, the, the chegged fungi, your, your, your clavarias, your hygrocybes, entoloma, uh, geoglossum, and uh, dermalomas. So that's your chegged fungi, which is your high-grade uh, conservation. And there's this um, there's this growing um, response now to a tick list as well, a red one, a green one, a yellow one. That is detrimental yes. to conservation work. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that some ecologists are actually taking that. Yeah, yeah, we did a survey and we had a, a, a checklist of five or, or, or ten. And it's like, okay, so we had a red one, a yellow one. So, well, hang on a sec, a yellow or oh, a yellow club. Right, okay. Did you know there was potentially four or more clubs in that field? And, you know, so you've just downgraded a field by, mm-hmm. by classing it as one. If there was red fungi, you know, and you've down- downgraded it by classing it as one, and there could have been five species. So, again, it's a lazy route. Oh, yeah, the has been done. No, that could be a field that's gone from locally important or negligible to nationally important. And you've actually, you know, potentially downgraded that field where you're already trashed on a botany report because it's not holistic you know because uh, if, if you're passionate about insects you'll you'll see thistle which is uh you know the, the big tick for biodiversity poor on a pasture report and for me or anyone that's into insects you're going to go oh thistle brilliant lovely you know because the associated pollinators with it mm. um and they're not just associated pollinators they're empty species of fungi associated with it so to us, it's like, whoa, it's essential. You know, obviously you don't want to feel plastic in this. I'm not saying that. Um, but that nutrient, but also it's understanding how everything works because that high nutrient area very often is restricted to just an area because it could be the latrine. If, if it's a pony graze area, that could be the latrine area. So the rest of that field, you might have that score is massive for the, the thistle in our area. But in actual fact, the rest of the field isn't. But you've just gone down greater field using a bottom report um and i i feel that that system needs to change and it needs to change yesterday um that you know grading a field on a bottom report um it should never be done on just botany um you get fields which are written off and they saw there's no interest there whatsoever it's a it's a poorly grazed field and it might be lucky it's a site already been to and i'll, and I'll whoa hang on a sec mm. get back there mm. um because i can assure you now that come you know october you'll have 30 species of checked fungi there why are you not highlighting it for a report? Um, so, you know, it's something that um, it needs to change. Um, and it needs to change fast because we're losing now farmland, especially in Wales. Um, it's being bought for uh, tree planting, for soil farms. We're losing so much habitat now, which was um, written off as, as uh, poor pasture. Um, and the thing is, is that you can turn back the hands of time on poor pasture if it's um, had lots of um, chemicals added to it. When a farmer cuts back, within two years, you'll start seeing um, wax caps. You'll see, you'll already see some wax caps, and you? you'll see hygrocerconica. It's quite resilient to um, fertilizers. But when you start cutting back, then the other species, very often the mycelium is still there, it still exists, and it's not coming back. You plow up a field and chuck in conifer for carbon offsetting, greenwashing, yeah. <laughs> because you've now destroyed that habitat. Um, you've acidified the ground, um, which then causes that knock-on to surrounding ecology. But they're getting applauded for it because it was a, a poor pasture that the farmer was, you know, destroying with yeah. his chemicals. Yeah. So what have you just done with 
20,000 conifers on a 300-year-old pasture, mm. that the biome was irreplaceable. That is an irreplaceable habitat. But, you know, you, you strip away the bad, you strip away if it's been overgrazed, you, you, you rotate instead, you change the management, you change the, you know, the, 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 you prevent the use of chemicals, and that habitat recovers. It doesn't recover when you've got 20,000 conifers on there. So where does this uh, awareness start then? So in terms of, you know, say this, you know, you know talks about, about habitat destruction and habitat, you know, species loss here, but um, in terms of awareness of such an important group of species... Um, yeah, where, where where should we be taking um, interest? Um, it's knowing and understanding. Um, so the more you understand fungi, you'll instantly know what should be there, which is a, which is causes trouble in itself because fungi don't read the books and they'll only float mm. them when they want to, and they're not always present. But it starts with our guideline, so you know potentially what could be there. Very often, the ecologists will, before they visit a site, they'll do their desk work first. I mask backwards. I don't do that. Yeah. Um, I like to turn up blinds to a site. I don't want any predetermined information. Um, I don't want to uh, know what um, uh, somebody else said about a site. I want to go there and see a site and get that gut feeling to look, to observe without any predeterminations, no influences from anyone else. I want to see what's there. And you see more. Because instead of looking for what somebody said was there, mm -hmm. you're looking for anything that might be there and you see so much more. Um, and then it's just all about understanding what's going on there. And this is where the holistic approach comes in because instead of uh, just thinking only about plants, only about the bats, is that you're then looking at the knock-on effect. So, you know, okay, we're going to lose our hedgerow over there. <sighs> okay, what's the knock-on effect? Rather than, yeah, we're going to lose a hedge or we're going to mitigate. And that's not being done enough. It's, it's that understanding of the knock on effect of what's in that hedgerow. Is it in any other hedgerow? Because our hedgerow might be 300 years old yeah. and the rest may only be 100 years old. So that loss of our hedgerow there could have a massive detriment to the rest of the area. Or I saw in a report uh, for, for a farm that, that's um, under threat and um, the ecologist wrote in there a 10 metre buffer for the development from ancient trees. Mm. That was insane. Mm. Insane. But the developer is then able to use that ecological expertise and have a 10 metre buffer on ancient trees. The, the guidelines alone don't even say it there. It's all about mm. girth measurement and height measurements, you know, for, for a buffer. But an, eco an ecologist actually wrote in a report 10 metre buffer. And that infuriated me mm. because that was negligible. You know, that was irresponsible. That was so many things that was insane um, because the tree, I mean, and, and these were ancient oak, ancient ash, um, and ancient uh, black poplar. In, uh, to find ancient black poplar, you triple yourself with excitement. It's yeah. like, whoa, yes. <laughs> really, 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 really exciting stuff. But, um, you know, oak to a side, uh, you know, the black poplar to a side, you tell me what's going to happen to ancient ash if there's development anywhere near ancient uh, ash that's within its fall zone. Mm -hmm. That tree won't be standing mm -hmm. because straight away they're allowed to use health and safety and say, unfortunately, that ash is a risk to our staff. You know, and although we we know we're a little bit back from there, we're going to take that ash out because the, we could we've done our plans within a ten meter buffer zone of the tree lines, and that ash. She's going to fall 15 or 20 metres if she comes this way. We're allowed to take her out. Immaterial to what she supports. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely insanity. Um, but again, it's like that... Yeah, I wasn't even in there. How was I even allowed to be in there? Who? Who? Um, yeah. Okay. You... <laughs> Because <laughs> every time I go to this site, As it, yeah, yeah. you're walking along yeah, the, and then you're looking and then you're saying then, you know, OK, can it's we just... get a girth measurement on this tree? And you're thinking, even at 25 metres, she's in trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, but, you know, root structure alone, 10 metres in an ancient tree. It's nothing. And these are qualified, mm. you know, seam registered <laughs> ecologists yeah. writing in. Where, you know, are you an arborist? You know, where's your qualification? I'm not allowed 
to, to pass judgment on a tree. Oh, the hell are you writing in a report? A 10 metre buffer is recommended by this firm. Yeah. yeah. And we do see tree. I mean, you know, I, I see the heart because I'm, lots of my work is, is what I call lip service. You, you're writing what's going to be lost. And when you go into a site, or you're passing a site and you can't help but look even though it's painful and you see the devastation and you'll see the trees that um, were year marked that should have been saved have gone. Mm. And when you speak to the bodies on site, they'll go, oh yeah, what happened was, yeah. um, we, uh, you always have to extend out. So when they say that this is a plan work, um, you always should be asking the questions. Um, so that's a site plan. Where are your vehicles going to be stored? Mm -hmm. Where's your materials going to be stored? Because all that extends out. And they're always a bit sneaky. They never put that in that in that base plan. So then you have to remember then that outside that work, you know, you've got then you've got your safety work zones, your safety corridors that extend out. Yeah. So that ten meter buffer no longer it's got, exists. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I you know, I, I've seen ancient trees which are very sneakily ancient oak trees, you know, five hundred year old trees where the big screens have gone up mm. um and uh, the trees are gone, you report to NRW report, um, you know, to the local authority and they come back and they go, Yeah, what happened was health and safety officer stated that the trees are risk to, the, to the, the staff on site so we we can't do anything about it they've acknowledged the loss blah 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 but yet there happens to be then a garden where those trees were yeah. when the development's finished mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and in, unfortunately we are sometimes ecology's biggest enemy because we overstep the mark on our expertise and what we could be saying and what we should be saying is that instead that report should have been those ancient trees need a thorough inspection. You have to have an arborist in. You have to have those trees measured. Um, and as an example, the one tree there, you know, she's however many feet tall with the girth of so and so, yeah. which means yeah. there would be a minimum, an absolute minimum, that you need somebody else in now. So it's actually documented instead of saying 10 metre buffer yeah. that didn't protect an arbitrary fi figure just plucked out the air because it's not yeah. a round figure yeah, yeah. yeah. rather and, than actually anything yeah. could... and, the, and the land developer goes oh brilliant 10 metres mm. 10 metres yeah. it's right then yeah. it's right then it is Richard <laughs> and um, everything has an ecological role so you have uh, your, your um, entomophoras which are insect control um, which I find fascinating and like you know your zombie fungi um, and other people go oh that's horrible that's cruel well, there's no cruelty in nature mm -hmm. you know nature mm -hmm. just you know it's it's a natural um, pest control like when you see um, I, I always say people if you're looking for cement in Mavara um, uh, Muscat is one of them on, on the on the blue bottle family is if you see a dead animal and there's a canopy above there or, or are you anything at all have a look so when you pinch your nose if you don't like bad smell, pinch your nose and have a look and I'll put money on it is that you'll have um, uh, flies stuck to leaves mm -hmm. by the bellies mm -hmm. and they're covered in the entomophora uh, fungi that's actually, because it's it's, um, it's spreading as well then around that corpse, you know flies do spread disease yeah. so in, a, in, in one way or another as well, they, they could have a part as well in preventing mass spread of a contaminant so if there was a, a, a disease animal died of that could be spread on flies it's also reducing that you know but also grasshoppers which of course you know can have a commercial issue one of the most you know fascinating one you'll ever find is the entomophora grilli the vex grasshoppers and it it actually reduces them apart from the fruiting body that actually comes out of, out, out of the animal as well the it, it dries them they wrap their legs around grasses um, and you'll always see, it's, it's a typical stance of any insect that's infected with fungi. It wraps their legs in, in such a way that it's cupping something. Um, and then the abdomen is, is where very often then attaches, the hyphae attaches mm. the abdomen first. So change to behaviour causes an insect to climb to the highest optimum point for, for spore uh, dispersal. But uh, the um, grasshoppers in particular, they always fascinate me because they completely desiccate and they almost look like a skeleton. A grasshopper and they just you know like these big you know hollow eyes and and it's fascinating and uh, people say oh that's grotesque no it's nature mm. you know the yeah. fact that that fungus is con they used to think it was mind control then understand now it's more muscle control you know obviously with chemicals that, that um force the brain to change direction but they actually to that the ability to um cause a, a, an insect to change its behavior completely 
um, I find it fascinating. And, and in some aspects, the, the only world that's been uh, is investigated um, in any crop test um, with entomophora, because they're looking for reproducing entomophoras in labs as well to actually use as a biocontrol right. method. Um, but in nature, there's um, there's ones that infect ants um, in rainforests. And some of those ants are highly, highly destructive, like the marching ants, which can cause ecological um, uh, chaos, even um, collapse, because they will eat anything in its in its path. The fungus controls their populations, so by actually, it always keeps that that uh, species within a number. That yeah, it still has wreaks of havoc in some areas, but at the same time, it is, is that if that fungus didn't exist, there is no natural predator of one of like, I think it's one of the fire ant species, and but they will eat. Um, you know, at flesh. So they will just keep on marching through and their colonies build and build and build. But instead, this fungus goes, hang on, hang on, hang on a sec. Hang on, hang on. Your numbers are just ridiculous now. Come back here, come back here. You lot are going to fall up this tree and you're going to die. So we're... I- I, I'd imagine that is this from reading, reading like scientific papers or is it? Yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's uh, you know some people have bedtime reading of a nice book. I did try reading that book you recommended, and <laughs> I do, and I'm there then going oh, that's yeah, and I, I do take notes and uh, you know, the time the time one. Yeah, I do take notes and then um, uh, and then I go, I get a little alert then a pile of papers and I'm going oh, oof. and I'm downloading the paper and going oh okay yeah it's uh, bedtime reading. Yeah. Um, it's it's something that you once you're into it you'll mm-hmm. never stop. Mm-hmm. Because there is something new being out every day, um, and because of me, I think because I, I like to I like to know what's going on as well, and uh, you know things will never you know I may never get to see those those uh, Amazon ants, but to me it's a mind blowing, yeah. um, and uh, I love horror. I love horror films. And it's not very often a horror film uh, makes me. I can, in fact, I can't think of any horror film that ever makes me think that could happen in real life. Like people say, well, I grew up in a cemetery, Richard. <laughs> yes. So I grew up in a cemetery watching. Horror films with zombies and walking the Walking Dead. <laughs> you know, when I watch the walk and people say, hey, are you, how can you do that? Because they're not real. Mm. You know, mm. the, the dead body's never going to animate itself. It's never going to happen, you know, because biologically that can't really just fall apart. You know, all these things, you know, it's not going to happen. And it's common sense, really common sense. But um, pathogenic um, fungi are something different. And as yet, they haven't crossed that, that boundary. We've got over 350 species of fungi on us and in us. You know, we've only known that for the past couple of decades. That's how far behind fungi yeah. is in, in, in human discovery. Um, so they're already growing in us and on us. You know, one of the biggest causes of premature baby death is due to fungi. Mm. You know, and that's, you think, why did they take so many years to discover you know, that it was fungi that was killing these little, um, premature babies, you know, in the uh, immature get. So um, it's, you wonder what else fungi could do. Yeah. And then there was a horror, and if you ever, if, if you don't mind horrors, there's a horror that came out a couple of years back, the girl with all the gifts. Right. Now that is a horror that uses fungi. Mm-hmm. And when you watch that, uh, <laughs> although there are some little, little, little uh, tidbits in there, but my micological head kicked on and go, oh, you didn't quite get that no, right. Yes. <laughs> you didn't quite get that right. But the baseline of the story, it made my mind go, Ooh. Right. it's a, a zombie version yeah. using um, fungi. Okay. So, so, you know, it's just basically infecting humans, changes their behavior, makes them highly aggressive, mm-hmm. violent. Mm-hmm. It, it, so any other human, they, 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 they go into attack which then allows them then also to make that contact to spread those spores. Mm. And there's a, at the end of the film, there's a one big giant, um, you know, sporulating mass. Um, <laughs> but there was a few, that was a few bits they had wrong. That, that was a right. bit like that, that, no, that isn't quite right. That isn't mm. quite right. But at the same time then, it made my mind go, when yeah. fungi make that jump, because again, these subjects, that these things are not being discussed in the wider world, is that fungi... Um, so certain species of fungi can't can't survive in in the in the human because of temperature, and our core human body temperature protects us. The human core is changing, mm-hmm. and it has mm-hmm. been for decades, which wasn't being recorded. And it's only in more recent studies where they, they know that um, you know in different countries that people have a different core temperature. So the medical core, which bases on are you healthy, are you feeling well, isn't the same globally. It's not the same. But we are changing globally anyway. And when that core temperature becomes optimum for pathogenic fungi, 
that's when I think we might yeah. be in trouble. Yeah. So, I, you know, to me, yeah. when people say, oh, yeah, we can end the world, you know, uh, or we can press that button. Mm. If, if if no one presses that button, fungi will do it eventually. Yeah, I don't. really, yeah, I think they, I think, you know, it's not viruses we have to worry about. It's not bacteria we have to worry about. It's fungi making that jump um, to be able to actually, they're, they, I mean, they're already infecting all insects. Mm. You know, insects have a brain. You know, they, they, they you know, they, they have a vascular system. They have muscles. You know, yeah, it's not a, it's a huge leap, is yeah, it? Really, yeah, to uh, yeah. yeah, you know, and they already, <laughs> fungi already cause massive problems for humans and for or for mammals. Mm. But it's that jump to um, that the mind control. I mean, there's fungi. You get fungi in your brain. Mm. You know, um, it can affect your brain. You know, so you know, there's fungi in the soil, which can cause you, you huge problems. Aspergillus, you know, is huge problem um, if it gets into into the body of, 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 a, of a frail person. You know, perfectly healthy person wouldn't bother them. I, I, you know, I hand aspergillus on uh, wax caps. Very often, you see blackening on a wax cap. Um, that, that's a strain of aspergillus. If it gets into an open cut, that could mm. cause problems. Mm. So I'm always mindful. You know, when I'm collecting specimens, um, if it's the only wax cap there that I can that I can take that and it has it on there, okay, more careful. Uh, and it's in a pot, and it's you know I handle it with care. And I'd always, yeah, I'd always scope the aspergillus just because they're made aspergillus. You need to culture get species this aspergillus. Um, but it's that jump. Um, but yeah. in the yes. back of my mind, it's almost like a little chuckle. I think, nah, mm. nah. You know, it's Corby got nothing on fungi. Mm. You know, it's something that uh, I think uh, if you're it's not one to look into if, if you're a warrior, not. So, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, we'll, we'll keep the anxiety to a minimum. Yeah, or, 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 or to, 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 to a keep bearable minimum. amount. Yeah. But uh, when I yeah. saw, you know, it was one of those, uh, it was the first time uh, a horror film actually stopped me in my tracks. Yeah, it was like, yeah. oh. oh. So you probably, you probably took a lot more interest in that film. Than yeah, than I, because it mentioned it was, I was like, I've got to watch yeah, this yeah, bit. Yeah. You expect it to be, you know, um, because they make always make so many mistakes on the horror, you know. Like uh, for me, like the zombie films alone, it's just the animation of, of, of a body that's, uh, you know. I said I, I used to be funeral director, so I know the various stages that the human body goes through. You think that uh, it wouldn't be possible? It's not going to happen, you know. Or after a fortnight, an arm can fall off. There's no way Joe Blocks is running down the street, you know, six weeks after he died, and I'm, you know, and, he, and he's still decaying. It's not going to happen. But so this was the first time it was a horror that did make me go. Oh, it's one of those moments you wish you didn't know anything mm. about mycology. Mm. You think, mm. Oh, because I'd always wondered, you know, could it ever happen? When would it happen? But then when horror, you know, the realm of horror actually picks up on it, it's like, I'm glad people talk about mushrooms, though. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the benefit, you know, the bonuses here. People are actually, it's making, it's making the big screen. If you enjoy our show and want to help, then please click on the subscribe button and rate us on your favourite podcast player. As that's how you can inspire ecologists in the making, help retain great talent and provide insights of our industry to a much wider audience of why ecology really does matter. Thank you. And remember, learning is a lifelong endeavour. So stay curious, be adventurous and build bridges for others to cross.